And this morning we're going to uh, finish off part two of our series, Bold. Everybody say it with me. Bold. Say it like you mean it. Bold. Bold. And uh, there's an old uh, family story in my household, my parents, of, and I, I've told you before, but it gets, I've, I've added to it now, so you're going to be excited about this, hopefully. And uh, I used to be an avid sleepwalker. I don't know if you knew that about me. And so my parents were, uh, I guess they were getting ready for a trip somewhere and left a suitcase open in their bedroom. And, uh, hold on one second here. And so I would, I got up and apparently, allegedly, <laughs> slept walked my way into their bedroom thinking it was the bathroom or the washroom. <laughs> and so the open suitcase was used as the to toilet. <laughs> Guys got that? Is that good there? And then uh, allegedly, I think it's probably my brother's, but this past week actually, it all came f full circle because I had uh, put the kids to bed, they're in bed sleeping, allegedly. And uh, I hear some rumbling up the stairs, so I go up the stairs, and just in time to see Cody, our six-year-old, walk into the washroom and not use the toilet, but use the garbage can next to it. <laughs> <laughs> and I yelled out, Cody, 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 hello. No response. So I knew that he was sleepwalking because he was just uh, blatantly disobedient to my calls to him <laughs> to say, Cody, you're using the wrong toilet. So, um, and so that turns out that I, j I couldn't do anything about it at that point. So he just slept, walked himself back to bed. And the next morning I talked to him about it and he had no idea how disobedient he was to me calling out, <laughs> calling out you're using the wrong toilet, you didn't flush. Et cetera, et cetera, all those jokes. And uh, so the, it came full circle, and then my dad found out about it and said, just like, like father, like son, huh? So that, there's your story for the day. And the reason I thought about that is because this morning, we're going to be talking about bold obedience, listening to the right voice, the voice of Jesus, and then stepping into what he calls us to boldly. Now, you might remember, some of you missed last week, we're going to do a quick recap, and uh, last week we started with me saying that everything you need to know about this series was learned in a Sunday school song. Do you remember that song? It's Be Bold. So I'm going to sing it here, you're going to sing with me, just to get going, get you loosened up here. I'm going to say Be Bold, you're going to say Be Bold. I'm going to say Be Strong, you're going to say Be Strong, and then all together we're going to say, for the Lord our God is with you. For the Lord your God is with you. Your God, not a, yeah. Got it? How many of you are so excited that we're going to do this? <laughs> uh, incidentally, before we sing this great song, Pastor Brian's away on vacation, so I'm allowed to sing any song I want, he said. <laughs> He's away for the week resting. Pray for him and his family as they're continuing to uh, uh, mourn but celebrate the loss of their, their father, his father, and pray for them that they get a good rest this week as they're on vacation. So let's sing this song together and sing it boldly. Ready? Be bold. Be bold. Be strong. Be strong. For the Lord your God is with you. One more time. Be bold. Be bold. Be strong. Be strong. For the Lord your God is with you. Yeah. That was good. I think we can stop. Ready for cake? <laughs> oh, we're ready for cake. So that's all you need to know. We can be bold and we can be strong. And why can we do that? For the Lord is with you. It's, a, it's funny, but it's true. He's with us. We can be bold and we can be strong. Here's a quick recap before we jump into the word. We're going to go to Acts chapter 5. Eventually, if you want to find that while I'm talking here, that's fine. Here's our theme verse for the two-week series, Acts 4.13. We covered this last week. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. And so last week we talked about bold faith. 
And here was our main point from last week. Well, here's what bold is. Showing or requiring a fearless, daring spirit. That's how we define it. That's our working definition for this series. And here's what we said. Time with Jesus, and you have this in your outline again. You can fill it out. Time with Jesus builds your faith, which leads to boldness that produces spiritual results. Time with Jesus builds your faith, leads to boldness, produces spiritual results. If you can't get it all down really fast here, I'm, I'll have this slide once again in a couple seconds, so don't worry. I see that you're very worried. Uh, we took this statement and then we put it into a chart because it's our time with Jesus that's uh, first and foremost essential for us to live a bold life for Christ. We need to find time to spend with him. So here's how the chart looks. Time with Jesus, that we make time with Jesus, that we spend time listening to his voice, being in his presence, being filled with the power of his spirit, and then we go and be bold. The same way in which we saw Peter and John do in Acts chapter 4 last week. Time with Jesus builds our faith, leads to boldness, produces results. So not only do we have the statement, we have this awesome chart as well. Time with Jesus builds our faith, leads to boldness, produces spiritual results. There it is again. So this morning, that's a recap from last week. This morning we're going to talk about bold obedience and we're going to go to Acts chapter 5. And here's what's happening in Acts again. Acts chapter 1, the apostles were given their final instruction uh, from the Lord before he went back to heaven. And it was to wait until you receive power from the Holy Spirit. Wait in Jerusalem, then you're going to be my witnesses, Acts 1.8, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Their first instruction was to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit before they went and did anything. Acts chapter 2, we see Peter and John healing a crippled man and starting to get uh, opposition come in because of that. Acts chapter, or Acts chapter 2, sorry, we see the Holy Spirit uh, coming. Acts chapter 3 is when they heal the crippled man. Acts chapter 4, we see Peter and John with boldness standing before the same people who a few weeks ago would have just killed Jesus. So Peter was transformed into someone who can be bold, and we'll see that in a second here. That was what was in Acts chapter 4. They saw their boldness, and they recognized them as being with Jesus. And so when people see our boldness, they can recognize us as being with Jesus. And here in Acts chapter 5, uh, at the beginning of Acts chapter 5, there's a, a, the Holy Spirit begins to work and, and produces fear among the people with a story from Ananias and Sapphira. You can read that on your own time, but we're going to jump in to verse 12, what transpires after all of this, trans as the Holy Spirit begins to work powerfully among them. So here's God's word for us this morning. Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 21. You have it in front of you on your uh, outline or on the screen in front of you. I will be reading this morning from the English Standard Version, the ESV, if you want to follow along on your uh, device. Acts 5, 12 to 21. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. Verse 13, none of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Verse 17. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. Verse 19. But during the night, the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. It's God's word for us this morning. Let's pray, and then we'll see how this fits into our lives. God, thanks for your word. Thanks for the power of it. Thank you that we can uh, sit and hear your word. I pray that our hearts would be ready to receive it, what you have for us this morning that we would be filled with the Spirit and walk in bold obedience following where you might lead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
So as we come to this bold obedience, we're going to talk about Peter, what we see in Peter's life, and then I'm going to give you five things about bold, uh, bold obedience. Can you high five someone and say he's going to give you five things? Do it. Five things. Five things. Five things. Stay ready. Here's the first thing that I want to uh, say, and this will get us into the life of Peter here in Acts 5. It is this, that bold obedience starts with recognizing the bold love of Christ. Bold obedience starts with recognizing the bold love of Christ. That we would recognize what Jesus has done in emptying himself and becoming a servant to us. Recognizing his great love for us that we can start to be bold in our obedience. And it's our bold obedience begins with who we're listening to, who we're facing, what direction we're facing. Some of you are like me, are very directionally challenged, where you can't find one place to the next, even if you've been there 16 times. But here's the thing I heard one time. It says, uh, one of the pastors in the state said this, he says, your direction that you're facing, not the intended direction, will lead you to your destination. How true is that? It's the actual, face, the actual direction that you're facing, not where you intend to face, will get you to your direction, where you're going, your destination. And Jesus wants for us to be people who are uh, directed towards him, focused on him, listening to his voice, and then stepping in obedience where he might lead us to. Stepping one step at a time that he leads us to. And it begins with recognizing the bold love that Jesus has for us, that he's going to lead us, and he's going to love us, and he's going to... Take us step by step. Now, here's Peter. How would Peter, Peter's our example here, and I want to I show you just a, a quick thing about Peter that will inspire us, hopefully, to be bold in our obedience. Peter, who a few weeks ago from this text had just denied Jesus three times. Here's what Jesus said to him on the night that he was going to be betrayed. Matthew 26 and 34, it says, Truly I tell you, Jesus said, and he's talking to Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So Peter was told this, and how did Peter respond? Because I think Peter, before he had the power of the Holy Spirit, was often bold, but often bold wrongly. He made wrong words. He spoke wrong things. He spoke boldly, but it was the wrong way. Here's what Peter responded. Peter declared... If you declare something, how are you sounding? Bold. Thank you. He declared it. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the disciples said the same thing. Here's how it, it played out for Peter. After a little while, those standing, this is later in Matthew, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows. You will disown me three times. And he wept, went outside and wept bitterly. So here's what Peter did. He called out, I don't know the man. After saying and declaring he was not going to disown him, he yells, I don't know the man. And then he went out and wept bitterly after he saw his actions. So what, in a, in a sense, here's what was Peter. What happened to Peter? He failed. So how does Peter, and how can we say that bold obedience starts with recognizing the bold love of Christ is because Peter is an expert in this matter. He failed, and he failed miserably, deny, denying Christ. At the time where his obedience was, on, uh, was needed, he decided to be ultimately disobedient, to leave, and he failed miserably. But here's what I want to say this morning, and I think it will hit our hearts pretty strongly. The love of Christ was greater than the failures of Peter, and the love of Christ is greater than the failures of us as well. His love is greater than any mistake, any act of disobedience, any failure that we have. We see that Jesus' love is greater than our failures. How's this played out in the, in the rest of the story for Peter there? I love this. This is in Mark's gospel, how he saw after Jesus had rose from the dead, an angel appeared to the Marys as they came and saw, looking for Jesus at the tomb. And here's what the angel said to, to the Marys. Go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Did you catch that? 
the angel said, go tell his disciples and Peter. Peter was one of the disciples. But the angel wanted to let Mary know to make sure Peter knows. Make sure he knows that his failure isn't the end. His act of disobedience is not the end. That my love for him is greater than what he just did. And so this love of Christ transformed Peter from one who had just denied Christ to one who can stand a few weeks later before those same murderers and say this. After he was told, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. So Peter went from denial to bold obedience and it was the love of Christ that got him there. And you and I will go from mistake after mistake to boldly following Jesus by the love of Christ and his grace for us. Maybe you're sitting here having made mistakes, having been disobedient, hadn't failed. But Jesus has good news for you that that's not the end. That his love for you will make us bold in our obedience. So as we look at this text in Acts 5, there are five things that I think come along with this bold obedience that we see in Peter uh, and the other apostles. And here they are. Five things. The first one is this. When we're boldly obedient, when we listen to the voice of Jesus and we take a step towards him, it will bring opposition. There will be people rising up. There'll be thoughts rising up that want to stop you from doing that which God has called you to do. He'll tell you to do something, and then we start taking a step towards him. There will be opposition. Look at what happens in our text this morning in Acts 5 and verse 18. Once the apostles started to step towards Jesus, were filled with the Spirit, were boldly obedient to what he called them to do, here's what happened. The high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducee, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. So the apostles start speaking about Jesus start being boldly in their obedience and with the power of the Spirit, they start spreading the love of Christ. And opposition comes in and they're put into public prison. And so I want to just, by way of reminder, so that when we're following Jesus and there starts to be things that uh, don't seem to be going right or seem to be uh, impacting you in the wrong ways, that there will be opposition when we start taking steps towards Christ. But again, his love for us is greater than what we're facing, that we can do it and we can stand and go forward through whatever it is that might try to stop us from following Jesus. Because oftentimes, uh, when you feel most like giving up, you're closest to where Jesus wants you to be. When you feel most like giving up, oftentimes you're closest to where Jesus wants you to be. I don't know if you've ever been called by the wrong name, but Ashley and I have a, a running joke that every time, and she, I think, has been called by the wrong name more than anyone I ever know. And so she has a running joke. Anytime someone calls her by the wrong name, she'll send me a message saying, you'll never guess what name I got today. And I was Allison or Angela or Michelle. She's got in uh, Lisa, I think. I don't know, I, for some reason, I think Margaret. She got all these names, and her name's Ashley. And so we kind of joke about that, that often, so often she gets called by the wrong name. And, and I, as I thought about that in this sermon here, that the number one tool that the enemy is going to use as you start walking towards Jesus is to start calling you the wrong name, to start calling you by the wrong thing, by tell, filling your head with the wrong thing. He'll start calling you unworthy, unqualified, unimportant, incapable, not worthy of love. He'll start calling you by that name when God has called you a very specific thing, and that's his child, his beloved child, that he loves you so deeply uh, that when you step forward, the enemy is going to step in too. But we can get through it because of the power of the Holy Spirit. How do you think Peter and the apostles here, they're thrown into public prison for speaking about Jesus? They got through it because of their power of the spirit that was with them. And we can do the same with the same powerful spirit that's available to us as followers of Jesus. So the first thing is, it will bring opposition. The second thing is, it will be backed by God's power. When we start listening to his voice and start stepping into what he calls us to, his power will be on display in greater ways than we ever thought possible. Look at what happens in our story this morning in Acts 5 and verse 19. But during the night, 
an angel of the Lord, opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. As the disciples were obedient, started speaking about Christ, opposition came, but God's power stepped in. An angel came and opened the door. His power was on display. Later in the, in the Bible, Paul will talk to, to us about, in 2 Corinthians, he'll say, my grace is sufficient for you, and his power is, uh, his power is made perfect in our weakness. So as we, even as we weakly step forward to what Jesus calls us to in obedience, his power will be on display in our lives. But our job is to respond to what he calls us to and step forward into it. And it will be backed by his power, an unstoppable power, the same power that was at work here in Acts chapter 5. Too often we just read through that and glance over it, but it was a, a miraculous work of God on behalf of those that were being obedient to him. He opened the jail and brought them out. Third thing, bold obedience will always require faith to step to where he calls you to. The Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. Here's what happens in our story in Acts chapter 5. Stand in the temp go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. Did you catch that? The powerful work of God. The angel came down, got the uh, prison doors open, and told the, the apostles to go preach about Jesus. What brought them into the jail in the first place? Preaching about Jesus. And the angel comes and says, you're free. Now go and preach about Jesus. And if I was an apostle, if I was thinking there, I'd think... The very thing that just landed us in here, you want us to go and do. It requires the faith, and we see the faith of the apostles on full display. Because they knew very well what happens when they go where they're going to speak about Jesus. It would end them back in prison. But they went anyway. Look at what it says. It says, and at daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they've been told, and began to teach the people. So immediately... The apostles did what they were told to do. Now, here's a good place for me to say this, because I believe that some of us have been hearing a voice from the Lord, hearing something that the Lord has been placing on your hearts for days and weeks, months, maybe years. He's been placing something on your heart. And I think the example of the apostles for us is that they obeyed immediately to what God had told them to do. And here's what it is. Delayed obedience Waiting so long is actually an act of disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. What do the disciples do? They get a word, what they're supposed to do, and they went and did it. Knowing full well what the end of that would be, they did it anyway. And I want to say this morning that as we're uh, spending time with the Lord, hearing his voice, calling us to do something, I want to encourage you that you can do what he's calling you to do. Be bold and not delay. Do what he's calling you to do. Notice that the, the apostles did not get much instruction on what they're supposed to do. Here's what it said. Go, tell the people the full message of this new life. That's your instructions. And their response was, go and do it. Because sometimes God will not give us Every single detail of what he's calling us to do, he's just giving you the first step. And I believe for some of us, he's given you a first step. And what I want to do this morning is encourage you to take that step. You can do it. Be bold in it, knowing that Jesus has gone before you. Uh, because in the Bible, there's, there are numbers of illustrations of Bible characters that required faith to step forward into what God was calling them to do, not knowing the full picture. You can read a lot about it in Hebrews chapter 11, but even in your own run-through of Bible characters, you can think, well, that Bible character needed faith. That Bible character needed faith. They didn't know what was going to transpire. That Bible character needed faith. And I think the same is true for us, that as we're following Jesus, we need to have faith. We need to be uh, stepping to what he puts right in front of us, careful attention to what he calls to us to and step into it. Here's the fourth thing. It will lead to rejoicing. We see this in Acts, 4, Acts 
uh, five where we're at today. There was the opposition. There was the faith. There was the opening of the prison gates. And then later in this uh, chapter, they're uh, suffering for the sake of Jesus. And here's what the Bible says. Their last thing in Acts 5 and 41, it says, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. So they celebrated. Their obedience at first was stepping towards something they couldn't see, but they did it. And it led to a joyful spirit. And I think for us, as we begin to be obedient to Jesus, it will lead to rejoicing. Even though the first couple steps are scary, it will eventually lead to rejoicing because God gets the glory and the honor. Acts 5 and 41, the apostles left rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And here's the fifth thing. Bold obedience will impact people for Christ. That's our mission at Parkwood Gardens Church, to impact people for Christ. That when we're boldly and obedient to what Jesus calls us to, all these things will transpire as well for us, but we will have a greater impact than we ever could think possible because we're doing what Jesus has called us to do. We're focused on him. Our direction is faced towards him, and we're listening for his voice because we've spent time with him that built our faith, led to boldness, and then the results are that we would impact people for Christ. And so as, you're, as we're wrapping up our time, I want to challenge you to think about what has the Lord been speaking to you recently, lately, that you just need some fresh uh, encouragement and empowerment to take a step. I want to encourage you, motivate you, inspire you to do what he's calling you to do with the reminder that sometimes uh, what God calls us to doesn't sound like a great idea. Sometimes God's idea doesn't sound like a good idea, and sometimes good ideas are not God's idea. The only way that we're going to find out about God's idea for our lives and for our journeys and for where he wants us to be boldly and obedient to him is listening for him, focusing to him. Here's what happened with the apostles here in Acts 5. Did they have an impact after all this? Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So they had this bold obedience to follow where he leads. And we have, let me end with this, which usually means I have 15 more minutes. <laughs> we have no idea what God can do through one single act of obedience. You have no idea, I have no idea what God can do, the God who can do greater than we ever thought possible, through one single act of obedience listening to his voice. Let's not talk ourselves out of what God is pulling us into. I mentioned earlier that I wasn't that good with directions. Last year we took a trip to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and we thought that this would be a great time for us to head to my grandparents' cabin in the mountains of Pennsylvania. And we had plugged it into the GPS. I think I was asked about 16 times probably, do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're going? I said, I plugged it into the GPS, and if the GPS fails, I have an inner GPS. <laughs> that if I see, <laughs> I said, I've been to that cabin, I'll recognize something. Side note, if I ever say to you, and you're giving me directions that I've been there, I'll recognize something. That means I have no idea <laughs> what I'm doing. So we took this trip to the cabin. I hadn't been there since I was probably 11 or 12. And uh, so we started taking this trip. And as you can imagine, the GPS was telling us, like, I don't know if we have the worst GPS in the history of mankind, but probably. It told us to turn, 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 and we started to get in deep into trees, rocky roads, mountains, like really close, like there's no possible way to even turn around. And Ashley would lean over and say, uh, are you sure this is the way? I think we need to turn around, because as the trees started just swiping the van and scratching up the side, I said, no, no, this feels like, I know there was a bumpy road <laughs> when we were younger. I knew that's where we were heading before, so we're almost there. Look, the GPS says we're almost there too, just 10 more miles of this. 
And so we, somehow, some way, we got enough signal to get in touch with my grandma to, to realize that we were totally out of the area where we were supposed to be. And so, thankfully, the Lord opened up a, had to be the Lord. There was a, just one little tiny way that I could turn around. If not, who knows where we would have ended up. I don't even think we would have been back by now if uh, <laughs> that had happened. But somehow we managed to turn around and get to our destination. And we, our GPS failed, I failed, but we got to the place by listening wherever my grandma was telling me. But the reason I shared that is because like earlier, the actual direction that we're facing, the person that we're following, I was following the GPS and my inner GPS, got us totally off track. The person that we're actually following, Jesus, will lead to where we're going, where we're actually going. Once we get our eyes off of Jesus, we will get so lost and confused, we'll have no idea where we are. No idea. But Jesus, in his grace for us, always calls us back. He continues to call us. And here's the thing, here's the trick. We need to spend time listening for his voice because there are so many voices that are trying to distract us. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his mission. But God says that he'd come for us to have life and new life. And so for us, as bold, obedient followers of Jesus, let's listen for his voice, take the step that he calls us to, and he's not going to give you 10 steps at a time, remember. Take that step that he calls you to and do it with the strength he provides. Even if you're fearful, still do it if you know that's what Jesus has called you to do. And it will lead to bold obedience that will lead to rejoicing and that will have us as a church, Parkwood Gardens Church, impacting people for Christ like never before. Let's pray together. God, thanks for this, your word. Thanks for the power available to us through the Spirit. I pray for each and every one of us in this room that we would learn to take time to listen to your voice and step in the direction that you call us to go so that we would be uh, obedient followers of you, lifting your name high. That even in places where we, we feel that we can't do it, God, I pray that you would provide us with strength for the journey, that our next step would be faithful to you. Pray for each of us in this place that your spirit would fill us up with power, help us to be bold by spending time with you, and that would grow our faith, lead us to being bold, and that we would see the results that would give you more and more and more glory. Jesus, thank you for your presence with us and your love. In your name, amen.